typically urticaria occurs with angioedema, so it's really difficult to discuss one without the other. Um, majority of the cases are uh, they usually coexist, so I couldn't just discuss urticaria without mentioning um, the pathophysiology and management of angioedema. Although we will not be discussing hereditary angioedema, uh, which is a m much, much rarer condition. Um, I will also discuss the different types of physical urticarias and try to present each with a, a specific case presentation to kind of um, magnify the diagnosis. I will uh, briefly present a differential diagnosis for uh, chronic spontaneous urticaria, which is the new, the new um, nomenclature from chronic idiopathic urtic urticaria. And lastly, we'll review the treatment guidelines published by the Joint Task Force for Practice Parameters. And I will contrast that with the recommendations by the European Allergy Council and the WAO or the World Allergy Organization because um, there are some uh, differences. First we'll uh, discuss a review or go over uh, the diagnosis of acute and chronic urticaria. Um, I'm sure all of us have uh, been um, have encountered urticaria in our, our practices uh, as a pediatrician and as an allergist. This is actually the bane of my existence because it's a very difficult condition to treat and I don't know if Dr. Henwino will um, agree with me in, in saying that it's um, you know there's a, a lot of patients with significant morbidities a lot of uh, side effects of medications um, some of them come in after having uh, been on steroids for a long time and I will comment on um, those treatment uh, later on in the talk so typically, um, the term acute um, is a, a very specific um, way to classify urticaria. The duration has to be less than six weeks. And by history, these lesions are um, fleeting, evanescent. Um, patients complain that the, their lesions are highly pruritic. They can erupt in any uh, part of the body. And usually, the wheels last um, less than 24 hours and can re-erupt um, in different sites. On examination, uh, patients come in with um, actually different colors depending on their um, um, their skin pigmentation. They could be raised or indurated, salmon pink or erythematous lesions um, with raised borders and central pallor. Um, the borders are usually well demarcated. Sometimes these lesions can be confluent. Um, and typically, I, you uh, elicit this history that they blanch; these lesions blanch with pressure. With pressure. Um, very importantly, acute urticaria or just run-of-the-mill urticaria does not leave any do not leave any residual bruising, um, because if they do, if there's any staining of the skin, bruising of the skin, it would be important to send these patients for further evaluation to rule out uh, urticarial vasculitis. Um, I reproduced all my pictures uh, with permission, um, and so this is a, a baby came in with a post-viral infection, um, and, and these are typical uh, urticaria lesions uh, for infants and, and children. They usually come in with target lesions um, all over the body, um, face, neck, and even uh, areas with hair or glabrous skin. Most often, uh, the pathophysiology of acute urticaria and angioedema is um, driven by IgE um, and um, the activation of basophil and mast cells. So IgE presenting with an allergen causes basophil and mast cell degranulation. Um, so in essence, uh, histamine and, and basoactive peptides like leukotriene, LT4, and prostaglandin, specifically PGD2, are released. And these are very potent uh, vasodilators. So um, after vasodilation results, there's a significant release of plasma. And depending on um, the level of the, of the skin, it shows up as urticaria if it's in the mid to upper dermis. And uh, if it occurs in the lower dermis and subcutaneous tissue, it manifests as angioedema. 
Um, usually this process occurs um, immediately and after 48 hours um, there is uh, resulting very vascular non necrotizing infiltrates with very few cells that are visible in biopsy. So usually this is a characteristic of um, the acute lesions. Sometimes um, and more rarely uh, acute urticaria is caused by a direct um, response to proteases that are released or contained in food, um, inhalant allergens and infections by direct activation of the complement cascade. So it can bypass um, mast cell and basophil activation and can, uh, does not necessarily require IgE. So WAO reports a significant burden of disease um, and there could be a lifetime prevalence of 20 percent. Um, and this is very similar to the data that's reported in terms of prevalence by the Joint Task Force for Practice Parameters. So um, this stands for Joint Task Force and it's a commission that has, um, is representative of the two allergy societies in, in the U.S. and they report a lifetime prevalence of 15 percent. The reason um, I mentioned earlier that it's important to discuss urticaria and angioedema together is because majority of the time um, these processes coexist. Um, Forty percent um, of the patients present with just urticaria and 10 percent present with just angioedema. If angioedema occurs without um, urticaria, this gives us a clue that it could be um, bradykinin-mediated, um, either um, as a side effect of drugs um, or ACE inhibitors or a C1 esterase um, deficiency, which is uh, very rare. Um, I just wanted to show more pictures of um, uh, urticaria just to show that there, it can present as um, different sizes of lesions and different colors and different um, distribution. Meanwhile, acute angioedema by history, um, they're non pruritic uh, Sometimes these patients complain that the lesions are, are painful and the swelling occurs deep in the dermis and the subcutaneous tissue. And usually it affects um, the peripheral tissues um, such as the hands and feet, but um, in some cases it could also affect the face, lips, and eyelids. In rare cases, and it could be more life-threatening, angioedema could occur um, in the gastrointestinal tract and cause unexplained abdominal pain. So a lot of uh, these patients, since the, the swelling is not visible, they um, may have had a history of unnecessary appendectomy or exploratory laparotomy. On examination, the uh, angioedema lesions are usually um, present with ill-defined borders. The, the angioedema is non-pitting and um, they may or may not have uh, urticarial or erythematous lesions. Um, as mentioned, they, uh, the more serious involvement would um, include the gastrointestinal tract, the larynx, and uh, genitalia. So this is just a um, picture depicting a typical lip angioedema, it, it extends to the um, beyond the vermilion border so uh, that's why the borders are ill-defined and you can see the um, face of this patient um, it's almost shiny from um, the extent of the swelling. Um, this is angioedema of the hands and fingers um, it shows the it can obscure or spread and obscure the bony borders or the bony landmarks. Um, this is an example of a patient with um, eyelid angioedema. Um, the important caveat when discussing uh, acute episodes of urticaria and angioedema is um, the history. If there is multi organ involvement, such as um, hoarseness, which can indicate laryngeal edema, wheezing, which can indicate involvement of um, the lungs, vomiting and diarrhea, which can indicate GI um, involvement, hypotension, um, which can indicate cardiovascular involvement um, or neurologic involvement in manifesting as change in mental status, um, it's important to make sure that the patient uh, is not anaphylactic. 
and this should be high in a differential diagnosis for all patients who um, come in with that history. And um, in the interest of time, I will not be discussing anaphylaxis, but there is a um, current and revised practice parameters uh, published in the Annals of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology in the November issue, um, and I've included that here for your reference um, and uh, further review and study. So this is just a summary, um, acute versus uh, chronic, the duration is key. Um, lesions um, that last for longer than six weeks come under a different category and may require a different set of laboratory testing. Usually acute lesions um, last for less than 24 hours but may recur. In majority of cases, um, acute cases have an an underlying reason that you could identify, you could test in the lab, and um, usually help the patient clarify the, the reason. But the vast majority of cases of chronic urticaria are idiopathic, and, and that's why I like to emphasize this um, in this part of the talk. History is crucial um, in helping our patients um, and also teasing out what laboratory uh, procedures to order, what laboratory tests to order. So in the history, it's I usually ask um, when did the lesion start, what were the triggers surrounding the onset of the lesions, the timing of the onset of the symptoms, is it uh, temporarily related to weather change, um, pressure, food, um, temperature, sweating, um, inhaling air allergens, going to visit a family with a dog. So uh, these are important clues in the history that will uh, help us focus on um, the management. And also an important component of the history would be response to treatment. Another historical piece that uh, I think is important is if there are any medications. So, Oral contraceptive pills are um, notorious for causing um, urticaria and sometimes the patients don't think that that's a medication and they would not include it in their history, but it's a, a very common cause of, of acute urticaria. Um, any past medical history, such as um, history of thyroid disease, um, a history of travel, history of atopy, history of allergies is also an important piece of um, our history taking because again it will clue us in on possible causes of um, the urticaria lesions. Um, this is just a list of the common um, causes of acute urticaria and angioedema that are IgE mediated and this comes under the pur these come under the purview of um, allergy and immunology that's why it is interesting to me. Um, so air allergens, food, drugs, specifically antibiotics and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are common culprits. Um, stinging insects causing venom hypersensitivity is another common cause. Uh, parasites um, as another established uh, cause for re or acute urticaria and post-viral infections and rarely um, helicobacter pylori uh, can also cause acute urticaria. So the workup for um, these patients, especially if we would established that it's IgE mediated, um, would be epicutaneous skin testing. The recommended or the preferred method would be prick, but um, there are uh, still um, other allergists who use scratch testing um, for food and inhalant allergens. Um, there are specific techniques for doing uh, drug allergy testing um, and this could include uh, intradermal uh, skin testing as well. The only validated uh, way to measure specific IgE would be immunocapras. This is a kit that was developed um, in Sweden and um, only eight foods have had published positive predictive values that have been validated by double-blind placebo-control uh, food challenges. So the reason I put this in in this, um, in this slide is because uh, we see a lot of patients who undergo an extensive battery of food allergies, skin tests, or um, 
IgE testing for food or IgG testing for food which are unnecessary and are not helpful uh, for this, these patients because these um, results are usually not validated um, by published studies. In some cases, stool for ova and parasites, if the uh, patient comes in with a history of travel um, to clarify whether the urticaria is caused by parasites. And um, again, serology for H. pylori um, or other viral infections if the history is suggestive. Majority of cases, um, if you divide up the uh, prevalence of acute versus chronic urticaria, 70% of our cases would be um, coming under the acute case. And this is more common in children and more common in patients with a um, history of allergies or A to P. Of the cases presenting with chronic urticaria, the vast majority are um, chronic, spontaneous, or, or idiopathic. Um, and only 20% um, have an underlying cause triggered by uh, physical urticaria. So usually chronic urticaria is described as continuous or intermittent lesions. Um, typically they occur daily for longer than six weeks. And this is a condition that's more common in adults. And there's a female pre preponderance, um, almost two to three uh, to is to one. So um, it's more commonly seen in, in women. Um, and there's usually no history of allergies in these patients who present with chronic urticaria. So let's shift gears um, and I go back to my learning objectives just to um, help us or guide me in terms of um, an outline for the talk. Um, I'm presenting physical urticarias with um, case presentations. So um, I, we, I, ha I have a 32 year old Asian female who has had a history of extreme generalized pruritus and hives that erupt on her neck and chest before public speaking. Um, this causes uh, a lot of anxiety. Um, she, she reports that these lesions are papular, sometimes linear, um, or sometimes welt-like rashes on, on her legs when she jogs or runs outdoors. Usually these rashes resolve when um, the activities are over and, and do not recall unless they have triggers. So what would be a differential diagnosis for our, G, our patient? Correct. Correct, Dr. Santiago. So, I, I have listed the um, I have listed the different types of physical urticarias that fall under chronic urticaria, and I will present some cases to show examples of each of them. But this patient that we just saw or discussed has cholinergic urticaria, and it's usually triggered by sweat, excuse me, stress, anxiety. Um, and I put here exercise, but there is an emerging set of exercise-induced urticaria um, that may require exercise to be a separate type of physical urticaria on its own. Um, eating spicy food or taking hot showers uh, would be another important trigger for cholinergic urticaria. All right. So um, Mary Kazal, uh, a big group of dermatologists, published um, this breakdown in terms of the prevalence of the different physical urticarias and by far the most um, common cause of physical urticarias would be dermatographism. Um, 52% of all cases of physical urticaria um, falls under dermatographism and with the, the other um, four distributed um, in smaller percentages. So cold induced urticaria is 15%. Pressure-induced urticaria would be 10% and cholinergic urticaria would be 3%. Um, solar and exercise-induced fall have 1% each. So just a uh, small blurb on cholinergic urticaria. It occurs <clears throat> between the second and third decade of life. It's usually a benign process. Or, uh, it's not associated with any anaphylaxis. It's caused by histamine release from direct stimulation of the mast cells on the skin. So again, the treatment uh, would be prevention. So avoid the triggers, avoid stress, um, avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, take lukewarm or cool showers. And if, becomes, if it becomes debilitating, I, I usually put my patients on antihistamines before 
a stressful situation. Okay, this is next case. Um, is FM, is a 21-year-old Asian male, actually a Filipino male, with a history of eczema um, during infancy, who came in with a history of acute recurrent uh, linear hives when he scratches his legs, chest, and abdomen. He lives in the dorm. Um, he left home to be in a uh, college a few hours from home, and usually this, this um, is triggered by him moving away from the home. His rashes, rashes and itching last for a few hours and then resolve. He describes his lesions as, quote unquote, I can write on my skin by scratching. Um, so what do you think is our, does our patient have? <laughs> um, so the next uh, classification of physical urticaria would be dermatographism. So th this is in our graph, is majority of cases with a physical urticaria manifests as dermatographism. Um, so these patients come in with, um, you know, dramatic lesions on their skin, especially on areas that they scratch um, or touch or um, uh, irritate. It affects uh, two to five percent of the general population, and it's it results from direct mast cell degranulation, uh, usually from scratching. So the initial lesion is a, a white lesion caused by vasoconstriction, and then subsequent pruritus and erythema results um, with the linear urticarial lesions. It resolves within minutes, so sometimes you could actually have the patient demonstrated to you during the clinic visit, um, and by the time the clinic visit is over, the lesions have disappeared. Um, again, if it's a debilitating condition or concern, um, I, I put FM on an antihistamine um, at bedtime and see if this will calm uh, this process. It could be or it could be concurrent or be a comorbidity with other inducible urticarias, and it's the most common form of physical urticaria. It peaks during uh, early adulthood. Oh, I just put this back so we could um, see the distribution that we. Um, discussed earlier. Now, um, there's another patient, and uh, this is going to lead us to another diagnosis. This is a 48-year-old female who presents to clinic with new symptoms. Um, she suffers from large, palm-sized, extremely pruritic welts on both buttocks after sitting on the airplane or car for prolonged periods of time. These lesions erupt after a few hours of arriving at the destination and last for days. And by recall, this patient um, states that there's a history of welts on, on her shoulders when she's carrying heavy shoulder bags. What is your diagnosis? What do you think this patient has? Yearbook-induced pressure urticaria. So um, GT has a type of physical urticaria caused by pressure. So pressure... Um, urticaria is caused by prolonged sitting, laying down, or tight clothing. Um, there is actually a method for diagnosing uh, or uh, proving that that's what your patient has. Um, and this was published in 2004 by Lawler and Black. So you put a 15 pound weight that you could suspend by arm straps over the shoulder and you have the patient walk around for 15 minutes. And then when you remove the, the weights or the straps, um, you uh, can actually document the induration and the tenderness caused by the pressure um, at least two hours after the testing. Okay, this is SN. He's a seven-year-old Caucasian male who presents with a one-year history of having developed diffuse urticarial lesions, dizziness, fainting a few minutes after he went swimming in a cold lake uh, during their summer vacation. He subsequently developed wheels and he came out of the pool or was brought out of the lake, sorry. Um, he broke out in wheels on the exposed skin. Um, subsequently, the mom reports that when he's waiting for the school bus during the winter months, his exposed skin on the face um, and on the ears would break out in rashes. What do you think our patient has? So, um, 
SN has acquired cold-induced urticaria. So this is typically uh, caused by rapid um, changes in skin temperature by uh, immersing the body in cold water or exposure to cold wind. So that's why SN develops uh, facial wheels and urticaria when, um, during the winter months. So this is just an example of cold-induced urticaria. The way we, um, again, this is reproduced from um, DermNet. The way we can diagnose this is by using the ice cube test, um, or you could put ice on um, a small glass and put it on the skin. So you could leave this on the skin, and um, for 15 minutes, and, and when you remove the ice cube, during the rewarming phase, uh, you could elicit the urticarial lesion. Um, this is called the ice cube test. Um, so the pathophysiology would be wheels and erythema um, and pruritus developing within, fifth, within minutes to 48 hours of exposure. Occasionally, the, this can be more severe. It can cause, in, cause fever, headaches, dizziness, loss of consciousness, and hypotension. So these patients are at risk for drowning and um, suffering from an anaphylaxis type episode. So I usually send these patients home with um, an EpiPen auto-injector or a pre-filled um, epinephrine syringe. The caveat here is the negative ice cube test does not rule out all types of cold-induced urticaria. In rarer cases, there are um, familial um, muckle wells, familial cold auto-inflammatory um, urticarial syndromes uh, falling under the uh, cryopyrin-associated periodic syndrome, familial cold, auto-inflammatory urticaria or muckle wells. So these are just rare conditions caused by mutations of the NR NLRP3 gene. So usually these patients um, also have sensory neural hearing loss, amyloidosis, and cutaneous lesions. It's probably, um, uh, it's one of the rare conditions, but there's actually research on it in its management, medical management. Differential diagnosis of chronic spontaneous urticaria. Um, again, majority of these cases are idiopathic or uh, no, no identifiable cause. The prevalence is about 0.5 to 5 percent, depending upon your uh, reference source. It it has a 1.4 per year incidence. It's very difficult to differentiate chronic spontaneous urticaria from chronic urticaria vasculitis. So usually this subtype of vasculitis is associated with autoimmunity and um, hypocomplementemic disorders. The, some classical historical features to differentiate uh, CSU with urticarial vasculitis would be um, the presence of pain. So you, usually the urticarial lesions for vasculitis are, are painful, sometimes even um, presenting with a burning sensation. They usually last for more than 24 hours, and these lesions are palpable and non-blanching. There is residual bruising and staining of the skin. Okay, we... So I've listed here the um, differential diagnosis for chronic spontaneous urticaria. Um, rarely, is food, um, inhaled allergens, and drugs involved in the un underlying pathophysiology. So aside from idiopathic um, or unknown causes, um, chronic infections such as hepatitis B, C, herpes simplex, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, and Helicobacter pylori are listed under possible causes of chronic spontaneous urticaria. Other systemic conditions, involving low complement levels or immune-mediated um, conditions such as JRA, SLE, Sjogren's, cryoglobulinemia, hypo and hyperthyroidism um, is also listed as possible causes. But again, these are all rare. And even rarer would be neoplasms. It's been reported in ovarian tumors um, and other lymphoproliferative malignancies. So chronic spontaneous urticaria um, is actually the the orphan condition in, in allergy because it's the, the pathophysiology is very poorly understood. 
forty percent of these cases have a positive um, autologous serum skin test. So you extract the patient's um, blood, centrifuge the blood, and separate out the serum, and re-inject that serum as part of the skin test, uh, intradermal skin test. So these patients are. Um, this suggests autoimmunity in these patients. 30 to 50 percent of them have IgG antibodies to um, the high affinity IgE receptor, specifically the FC epsilon R1 alpha. And um, a smaller percentage, 10 percent, have direct antibodies to IgE, not, not just the IgE receptor. 25 percent have antithyroid antibodies. Um, this this um, percentage closes in to um, a lot of these patients getting uh, thyroid function testing as routine parts of their evaluation. The biopsies for these chronic lesions showed, show mixed cellular infiltrates, um, which include polymorphonuclear cells, eosinophils, neutrophils, basophils, and um, different subtypes of T lymphocytes um, namely the CD4 and CD, CD8 population. And again, the differentiating key um, finding in chronic spontaneous urticaria is the absence of perivascular necro necrosis. Whereas um, in urticarial vasculitis, there is a, there is an, a perivascular necrosis that's seen on biopsy. All the, the um, recommended guidelines, um, all the data recommends a limited work, if at all. So uh, these patients usually undergo a battery of tests which do not yield any clue as to the underlying cause of their disease. So limited workup is um, the way to go. Uh, it, usually this is, I limit my evaluation to very few tests that include a CBC, urinalysis, um, C-reactive protein, and ESR, liver function tests to uh, look for elevated liver enzymes, thyroid function testing, um, and glory uh, uh, antibodies. And very rarely have I sent patients for a skin biopsy. Um, in a couple of dermatology publications, they've shown that, that laboratory, laboratory testing, blood testing, all of these that we've mentioned have very limited utility and have identified less than 5% of the underlying etiology of CSU or chronic spontaneous urticaria. So um, sometimes we do this just to be able to reassure the patient that there is no serious underlying pathology. So it's recommended that testing be focused based on the history and physical exam. And the current um, commercially available assays for surface markers, um, such as anti-CD203C for uh, and basophil histamine release, so this is a marker for mast cell activation, have very limited clinical application. Um, and I think autologous serum skin testing is, uh, although I've done this in fellowship, um, has, is usually reserved for research um, purposes. Lastly, the, um, so this will be the summary of the current treatment guidelines that were published by the Joint Council, the Joint Task Force. Um, first, we start by identifying triggers, and that's why we talked about this in the previous slides, that the history is key um, in a lot of these patients because it will help guide and focus our management. And once you've identified these triggers, avoidance uh, and educating the families on on how to avoid these triggers or remove them from the diet are important. And then the stepwise approach um, I will be discussing in more detail. Um, you can start off the patient in different steps depending upon the severity and the history of response to previous medications. So step one, which is the most um, well-studied recommendation is monotherapy with a non-sedating antihistamine. Usually non-sedating antihistamines would mean the second generation and third generation antihistamines or H1 blocker. 
at follow-up if there's no response in two weeks. Um, you are, hold on, you're able or recommended to go to step two. So I wanted to just do a quick blurb on histamine. Um, antihistamines are usually revert, are inverse agonists for a type one a histamine receptor. First generation antihistamines are sedating because they cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, and I put here examples of first generation antihistamines um, with a designation of their safety in pregnancy and breastfeeding. So diphenhydramine, chlorpheniramine, ciproheptadine, hydroxazine, and doxepin are important examples of first generation antihistamines. Hydroxazine and doxepin are um, category C for safety in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Types of second generation antihistamines include loratadine, cetirizine, and um, terfinidine. Terfinidine was taken out of the market, um, I think a decade ago, due to um, cardiac side effects. Now the third generation antihistamines are technically second generation um, modified molecules of second generation, so antihistamine. So levocetirazine would be an, an enantiomer of cetirizine, and desloratadine is the active metabolite of loratadine. Uh, fexofenadine would be Allegra, and the only medication, third generation antihistamine that's safe for pregnant women is le levocetirazine. Now step two for um, treatment if the patient return when the patient returns and the lesions have not improved, we are able to increase the dose of non-sedating antihistamines up to four times the recommended dose. So some of my patients have gone up to 40 milligrams of Zyrtec um, or Claritin. Or you could add another non-sedating antihistamine or add a leukotriene receptor antagonist or an H2 blocker, such as cimetidine or ranitidine. Or the other option would be to add dating first-generation antihistamine at bedtime. Um, the two examples of leukotriene receptor antagonists would be Montelukast or Zephyr Lukast. These are potent inhibitors of uh, leukotriene, especially leukotriene D4, which is um, a lot more potent than histamine and causing a wheel, wheel and flare response. So that's why it's been recommended for use in urticarial management. If the patient still doesn't improve, step three uh, recommended would be start a potent antihistamine such as hydroxazine or doxepin. Um, the note on doxepin is that it's a tricyclic antidepressant, but it was found to have H1 and H2 receptor antagonist function. Um, so the recommended dose would be 50 to 150 milligrams at bedtime. Doxepin and hydroxazine are very um, sedating, so you would really want to give it at bedtime and caution the patient about operating machinery or driving. Um, the difference between the U.S. Um, guidelines and the European uh, Asthma Allergy and Clinical Immunology and the British Society of uh, Allergy and Clinical Immunology guidelines is that the Europeans are a bit more liberal with using um, oral corticosteroids. The recommendation to start oral steroids is not uh, in the U.S. guidelines. Um, so, so this was um, something that was just approved. This was a, a very recent addition to the treatment guidelines. Step four for refractory um, urticarial lesions. Um, the FDA approved using um, omalizumab, which is a, a, an anti-IgE, a monoclonal anti-IgE um, that is given um, once a month. Um, again, step-down therapy for these medications can occur every two to six weeks, and these patients require very close follow-up. Um, just a note on omalizumab, it's a, a humanized monoclonal IgG antibody that it selectively binds free IgE, so therefore it inhibits binding uh, and activation of the mast cells and basophils. So it binds on the high affinity IgE receptor. And this this is well studied in asthma, and it's actually part 
of the step six management of asthma, but then the FDA also approved it last year, no, sorry, 2013, um, for use in refractory urticaria. So it could be given at a dose of 150 milligrams or 300 milligrams subcutaneously every four weeks for um, three doses. I'm not familiar with using cyclosporin, and I, want, I hope Dr. Henwino can um, address this um, as another uh, option for therapy in refractory cases. So takeaway points, acute urticaria and angioedema uh, usually in a, these cases have identifiable causes. Um, it's imperative that we make sure that they, um, these patients are not presenting with anaphylaxis. And as a precaution, I would prescribe uh, an epinephrine dose for the family until the diagnosis is confirmed. Majority of the cases of chronic urticaria are idiopathic. Therefore, laboratory testing without um, benefit or clues in the history and physical will be low yield. And so uh, just random or routine laboratory testing is not recommended. The only evidence-based um, proven treatment for chronic spontaneous urticaria are um, antihistamines. So the rest of the medications that we've listed here, like um, Dapsone, Sulfasalazine, Cyclosporin, um, hydrochloroquine and colchicine, um, there's very few evidence in, um, that um, recommends its use, but uh, it's been part of our list of drugs. So these medications should be used to dis judiciously. Thank you for your attention. Go class 90.